This year, Christmas came early for me, as we got the new Pixel phone earlier than usual, August rather than October. Right now, my wife is about to upgrade from the 7 Pro to the last 8 Pro, while I get the latest one, the Google Pixel 9 Pro XL. As you can see, I've been going with light colors with the pixels, this year's being porcelain. You can also check Matteo's video to see his hazel one and enjoy the unboxing experience of the device. Check the link in the description below. In today's video, we'll go through the setup experience, software and touch on some AI features as we go. To start, you'll need a SIM ejector tool which comes in the box and a SIM card. Well, you could just use Wi-Fi, I guess, but let's assume you want to use the phone as an actual phone. I took the SIM card from the Samsung A55 5G, which I was reviewing earlier. Unfortunately, unlike the Samsung, Google phones don't come with a second slot for the secondary SIM card or a micro SD card, so we'll be limited to one SIM and the storage on the device. Luckily, the 256GB version was discounted before the release, so I got the bigger version this year. Once we install the SIM card in the slot, with the pin upwards, we can put it back into the bottom of the device. Ok, let's switch it on now. We get the usual Google logo, but this time we get a teaser of what's to come. The logo changes to the Gemini animation, suggesting a lot of AI stuff coming. More on that later. After a moment, we get a welcome to pixel message with language selection, accessibility menu and the usual shapes bouncing with some nice haptic feedback. There are plenty of languages to choose from, but I'll just keep it as English US. So let's get started. You can set up using another device, but I always like to start from scratch to avoid keeping old apps I never use forever, so I'll skip it. Next, let's fast forward through a few steps. Signing into Wi-Fi, getting the phone ready, and signing into Google. For the last step, if you have two-factor authentication, which you should, you'll get a prompt on your old device, so let's approve it. There's a lot of terms and conditions, so let's skip that as well. Next, security. First, a pin, which they now recommend to be six digits long, so let's do that as a fallback. You have to enter it twice just in case. Then, fingerprint setup. This time, Google finally went with an ultrasonic sensor, which should be much better and faster than the optical one. I've been using it for 3 days now and it's working great so far. The setup went quite quickly. You can also add another fingerprint, but I'll do that later. It's great that they also encourage you to use face unlock during setup. Similar to Pixel 8 Pro, you can now unlock more secure apps like banking with your face, which is great to see coming back. The setup took no time, so let's continue and decide if we want to allow fingerprints and face unlock to verify Google Play purchases. That's the security done. Next, let's do apps and data. As mentioned, I prefer not to copy apps, so let's skip it. There's some Google service permissions like use of location, Wi-Fi scanning and sharing diagnostic data, and I disabled the last one. The phone will also automatically download software updates, which is great. Especially that Google now guarantees 7 years of security updates, which is just amazing. You can also decide if you want to back your device data to Google, which I like, so let's go with that. Next, some info about the warranty, about AI features, which we'll discuss in a moment, and even more about Google's Gemini AI features. There's also more about the Screenshots app, which I'll show a bit later as well. There's also some safety features like car crash detection and satellite SOS, useful when there's no Wi-Fi or mobile networks. You can also enable finding contacts nearby and sharing data with you, which might come in handy if you want to send someone nearby a photo or some other files. We can also configure Google Pay's payment methods by entering card details when requested. There's obviously some terms and conditions, and you can verify the card later on. Next, there's some quick setups. Language selection for instant translations, enabling or disabling the now playing function, which I'm always impressed by, configuring always on display, deciding how much info to show on the lock screen, emergency SOS settings, font size, which I actually increased a bit to see how it works, adding another account, which I'll do later, and reviewing additional apps. I kept most of them, but disabled Google Keep since I used Notion instead. 
Finally, a quick walkthrough of the gesture navigation. It's been my default since the Pixel 5, so I'll definitely continue using it. And that's it, well done, the phone is now ready to be used. The whole process took me just around 20 minutes, and that included filming, so it was quite smooth. We're on Android 14 this time, even though I've been using Android 15 beta for a while on the Pixel 8 Pro. Google aren't ready to release the latest version just yet, so we'll just have to be patient and continue with 14 for now. Luckily, the software is quite up to date. I got the August security update right after switching the phone on, which is always good to see. Just after the setup, the system and apps take up around 18GB of storage, which is a bit more than 16GB on the Nothing Phone 2A, but significantly less than some of my Poco, Samsung and Xiaomi devices, which took from 27 to 32 gigabytes right after installation. That means that there are very few apps pre-installed on this device other than Google Apps. So don't expect Facebook, Amazon or Netflix here, you'll have to download the ones you need yourself. Finally, let's talk about the key feature of this device, AI. The Pro version comes with a year's worth of Google One AI Premium, which gives you 2TB of storage, but more importantly, access to Gemini 1.5 Pro model. While not my favorite model, I prefer OpenAI or Claude Opus, this one should be great if you don't want to pay extra for other models. You can do a lot of typical stuff with it like image generation, various text prompts, as well as voice prompting. But as with all the AI models, you can't really trust it. The Pixel 9 Pro XL voice confidently told me it doesn't exist. What's the difference with the Pixel 9 Pro XL? There's no Pixel 9 Pro XL, it's just the Pixel 9 Pro. Google made a smaller Pixel 9 for folks who want a more compact phone, and then they beefed things up a bit with the Pixel 9 Pro. <laughs> Google hasn't announced any plans for a Pixel 9 Pro XL. You also get plenty of photo AI features, like the magic edit feature, which can reframe or edit your photo however you want. There's also the feature everyone's been talking about, Add Me, and I'm looking forward to testing it out, as well as other camera features. And there's plenty of other AI features like the dedicated Pixel Studio app, where you can create AI images. Well, except for adding people for now. and the Screenshots app, which lets you search through the, your screenshots, which I might find handy in the future. Overall, the software experience on the Pixel looks great so far. It's definitely been a focus for Google this year, and you can clearly see it. Luckily, despite the performance boost from the Tensor G4 chipset being rather limited, everything has been really smooth, so I can't complain. And the expansion to 16GB of memory must have helped as well. So, if you like minimal software experience and don't mind some extra AI features sprinkled in, you should definitely enjoy the new Pixel 9 Pro series. And that's it for today's video. Expect more videos from us as we're checking out the Pixel 9 Pro XL and Matteo is testing the Galaxy Z Flip 6, so if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to see more videos from us. But for now, thanks for watching!